come down um, and sit. Um, that includes uh, Kirk Goldsberry, who's a visiting scholar at CGA, uh, David DiBiase, who's here from Esri, um, we've got Jeremy Crampton, um, Nicholas, Nicholas, I apologize, uh, your last name, Oresovic, or 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 and uh, Sarah Williams. I think it looks like they're all here. Um, we're we're going to sort of jump right into this because um, Kirk has, has done some really interesting work with respect to some students, and I think they're going to talk a little bit about what the work is, and so we wanted to give everyone enough time to do their program. So maybe we can, we can start with Kirk, and then we can just sort of go down the line, and people can, can give their presentations, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. So Kirk? Um, my name is Kirk Goldsberry. I'm a visiting scholar here. Um, I'm going to talk to, to you guys about a project that, that I designed along with Peter Bull and Jeff Blossom in an attempt to get undergraduate students to think about uh, geographic privacy um, in new ways. Uh, so I want to rewind quickly to April 2011. That was the month in the year that it was revealed that, that Apple was not only recording our movements with iPhones, um, but also sort of carelessly storing the data trails, the breadcrumb trails. When you would sync your iPhone to your computer, these files would come along with that sync operation that would show your breadcrumb trail. The, they showed where you went. And there was an uproar, not as large as I would have thought it would be, but there was an uproar, uh, and included a congressional hearing hosted by uh, Senator Al Franken, who's a Harvard alum. And Apple was forced to issue a series of press releases. Uh, and, and one of the more interesting quotes that came out of that from Steve Jobs is, we haven't been tracking anybody, never have, never will, uh, which he said April 27, 2011. And in a separate press release, it said, they said, Apple is not tracking the location of your iPhone. Apple has never done so and has no plans to ever do so. Um, I think that that statement is, is ludicrous, um, and I wanted to show people that it was ludicrous. Uh, whether the, the, their original intent with some of this technology was to track the location of the iPhone or not, I think is irrelevant. Um, Apple knows where my iPhone is right now. So I took that data when I synced to my computer in April 2011. I mapped myself through this lens. So from October to April 2011, I wanted to make some maps to show people why this is a big deal. Because I don't think, as Chris Tucker and I were discussing yesterday, that the average person realizes how precious geodata is. I don't, re I don't think the average person realizes how invasive these kind of data can be. Um, and so as an example, I mapped myself uh, through the lens of my iPhone. I went on a vacation uh, in Hawaii and I, I mapped where it went uh, through the lens of my iPhone. Uh, and then for a geography conference that was in Seattle in, in April 2011, I tracked through my iPhone. Keep in mind, I was not intentionally recording any of this geographic information, but my iPhone was. And through the lens of this data, I was able to map out the trip after I got home. Um, so you can see I was flying from Detroit to Seattle, and you can see they're not the very most precise coordinates, but it's pretty apparent that at 6 p.m. Eastern on that day, on April 11th, that I was somewhere at the Detroit airport. And then my geodata would go away, and then 9 p.m., that breadcrumb trail would emerge, obviously, at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. And so I, I stayed at this conference, and many of, of my uh, colleagues here at this panel were at this conference, and I, I wanted to show, you know, what this looked like. So I went to the conference site, I went to the hotel site. You can see my trip up from the airport in Seattle. Uh, it's in the southern extent of that upper map up to the, the hotel and site. You can see where I was. And then I did some basic spatial analysis to show the density of, of my, my breadcrumbs, where I was the most. And you can quickly reveal somebody's sort of behavioral patterns in space through, through this information. And perhaps the creepiest example, uh, I'm a big sports fan. I went to a Mariners game with some geographer friends. And, we, uh, and the, it was clear with space and time using this, this, uh, this lens that, uh, that I was there. 
So while Apple had issued these statements about, oh, we're not tracking you, don't worry about it, I was able to sort of visualize my own behavior at a level that makes me think that they, won't, they are tracking me, or at least they have the potential to, to be kind. Um, so in, these, um, in the congressional hearing that followed, the Federal Trade Commission, which is you know, their, their, their motto here, uh, the, the government agency that's designed to protect us, our consumers, um, one of their big points is, hey, there's four holy data types in, in, that, that consumers deserve special protection uh, from. Um, financial data, you know, banking data, obviously. Medical data, obviously. Data about children, obviously. And then geodata. And then geodata. And one of the things that I think is a big point for this conference is I think American citizens are on board for all these top three. I think they would be outraged if similar things were happening with some of those top three categories. But we're not seeing that level of outrage, in my opinion, associated with the geographic data, and I wonder why that is. And as we talked about a little bit yesterday in the afternoon session, I think in part it's because people don't know what you can do with that information. People don't know that you can quickly find out where somebody lives, where somebody goes, where somebody goes to church, where they were at 2 p.m. on April 15th. Um, that kind of stuff. So fast forward to fall, and Peter and I are designing a, a, a mapping course here at Harvard, and we decided we wanted to sort of activate that concept in the classroom. And so we designed the Map Yourself exercise to emulate what this kind of data is, uh, what, what you can see with this kind of data. So we had, thanks to Nicholas here, we had a, a bunch of small GPS receivers, and we had the students take them for a week and track themselves, and then analyze their breadcrumbs, analyze their behavior, and then talk about their attitudes before and after that uh, experiment. So these students from all over campus took these things, uh, and then we took the two or three weeks afterwards to analyze the data in GIS and make some maps. And so at this point, I'd like to invite uh, two of the students to come talk about their experience, because we keep talking about, oh, young people don't care about this stuff, or young people, well, let's ask some young people. I thought that'd be a good idea. Um, so at this point, I think I'll have Juliana and Sophia Randolph uh, come down, um, and, and we're going to look at their posters. By the way, these posters are on display outside, uh, both, both these posters, and I'm going to have Jeff help me uh, queue up. Who wants to go first? Juliana? All right. So this is one of your last things at Harvard. You're graduating in, uh, in a short, short number of days here. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> we'll always know where you lived your senior year. Yeah, I know. Everyone's going to get to know all about you. <laughs> you want to sit down? It's a little crowded up here. Just make sure you talk into the mic. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Oh, so my name is Juliana. Um, I'm a senior at Harvard, and I took uh, Kirk's class. So, uh, like he said, the project required us to wear this GPS tracker for a week. And I just put it in my backpack, which is an article that I don't even keep as close to me as my iPhone. Um, but and the, project, the project ended up re revealing two pretty um, important things about my life. So the first was that just from putting it in my backpack for a week, you could clearly discern that I spent the vast majority of my time uh, around Lowell House, which is the big red dot. Oh. Right there. Um, and it's an undergraduate dorm at Harvard, and the Sherman Fairchild Building, which is up here, uh, which is a lab at Harvard. And it was pretty revealing and scary uh, to see that just from one week of data collection, anyone who had access to that information would easily be able to tell where I lived and where I worked. Um, and the second was uh, that I also carried the tracker on a weekend trip to New York to visit my family and friends. And when you isolated just those three days, oh, I'm just going to scroll down. When you isolated just those those three days, you could see uh, the journey down to New York from Boston, and you could also see my detailed whereabouts around the five boroughs. So it was bizarre that when I looked at the data, you could see that I like got off at Penn Station, had an afternoon around the village, spent an evening in Brooklyn, and then I like went to the Bronx the next day. And anyone who had access to that data could see an hour-by-hour hour, uh, 
breakdown of my travels around New York. Um, and the project was a real wake-up call for me about my iPhone and all these devices that we as a society, especially young people in our society, value. And this, this devices that could potentially be created in the future. And before the project, I was really unaware of all the geodata that uh, these companies have access to. So, um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Juliana. Uh, let's give her a quick round of applause. Thank you for coming. And then our next student is uh, Sophia Randolph. Um, I'll find the poster. Who is a freshman here? Who wishes there was more GIS courses at Harvard? Isn't that right? <laughs> Uh, is this going to work? Okay. Okay, so um, this was the project that definitely hit home the most for me because basically at the end, I almost titled the poster Stalking Sophie, but I decided <laughs> not to because that was a little extreme. But it is a real issue, and one of the ways this data can be used is for that purpose. So in my poster, I talk about um, other ways it can be used, like targeted advertisements. You can basically figure out what kind of lifestyle I live. Um, the uh, darkest maroon buildings in the top map are the ones where I spend the most time, which are at the track. I'm on the track team. Um, my dorm and where I eat, the freshman dining hall, which that alone is like pretty impressive that you can tell those three hot spots in my life just from this data. And then, like Juliana said, the hour by hour approach, this around the clock figure, which is clear on the map outside. Um, so that's a week's worth of data broken down by hours um, because my pattern is pretty similar day to day. And uh, I think the most interesting thing that came up for me throughout this process was that we did this like the week before Thanksgiving break and had the option to take the tracker with us home over break and I decided after looking at the first round of data I collected that I actually didn't want to take it home <laughs> over break because then you could tell like where I got my hair cut and where my doctor's was and where I lived away from school and for me somehow while this data is very personal, like being on a campus, my life isn't that different from every other student here. Essentially, you could probably come find students relatively easily when we're contained on this campus, but taking it home with me over break was a whole new level that I didn't want to get into. Um, and I think I don't have a smartphone. Yeah, I live in the dark ages. Um, <laughs> but yes, that is, that is an issue that people who don't know how this works are taking their phones everywhere. And I think people who are somewhat aware of how geodata works um, will likely leave their location benefits on when they have a choice because uh, the benefits outweigh the uh, seeming consequences, like having access to Google Maps is truly extraordinary, and if that means you put up with targeted ads, so be it. And you don't really realize like the even more extreme consequences because they haven't come up as much. Uh, like Kirk said, the Apple thing didn't blow up in the way you might have wanted it to. Um, and we live in this world so reliant on our devices that they have a sort of control over us, and we're willing to overlook their flaws in order to experience the convenience they provide. So for us to question and address the concerns would mean admitting that the way we use these devices needs to change, and that's going to be a hard conversation to have with a lot of people. But um, it becomes easier when we look at the data in this way, because the, vi the issue is really clearly visible, and that's a powerful tool over a lot of people, um, like seeing the issue this clearly rather than that folder that syncs with your data that you don't really know what it means when you put it this way, people will will take the moment and look at it and pause to uh, reconsider their views on it. So I think that's the role that uh, geospatial analysis has to play in this. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, David, I guess you should get up, but because uh, you're next, right? Are we going to you? Go ahead.
whatever order you like. Oh, whatever. I, don't well, I, think, I think Nicholas, why don't we just go down the road? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By the way, the fix for that bug in Apple software. So the bug, in their view, was having that file synced to your computer when you sync. So the bug wasn't to stop uh, tracking you. The fix wasn't to stop tracking you. The fix was to stop having that file synced to your local computer. So they're still doing that. That, that information is there. And one of the other issues is there's a fight to see if you can get access to your own data through these companies. I know that's what the Open Paths project the New York Times is working on is doing, but it's an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs>